afternoon, I'm uh, one of the senior fellows in the Association of the U.S. Army, uh, Lou Wagner. Uh, I want to kick this off this afternoon, and I want you to pay attention to these uh, handouts that they gave you when you came in. The uh, Public Affairs Office uh, would appreciate it if you'd fill those out because it will help them in the future to determine what kind of support they should give to meetings like this, and that uh, feedback will be very valuable. At the end of the uh, session today, uh, either hand it out, uh, hand it to the rear as you go out. Uh, I think there are some public affairs people here. Are all of you at the rear? Yeah, got two of them. Doors. If you'll just hand it to you to them when you go out, that would be very uh, helpful. As you well know, this uh, forum this afternoon is thinking past tomorrow. Where is Army modernization uh, going? Uh, we got a, a great panel up here. Uh, since I had a little background in acquisition for about 15 years, I'm very interested to hear what they're going to say, as I know all of you are. With that, I'll turn it over to the Honorable Heidi Shu, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, and she will introduce her people and take it from here. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jim Wagner. Can you hear me? Just a little bit closer. How about now? Okay. Okay, well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Institute of Land Warfare Forum on American Equipment and Mo Army Equipment and Modernization. It's absolutely an honor to be here this afternoon with you. By the way, for those folks who are standing in the back, there's still seats along here if you guys want to sit down rather than stand up for two hours, okay? Two hours? We're going to be here? <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I forgot to tell him that. <laughs> So anyway, it's an honor for me to join today by a distinguished panel of Army leaders okay, uh, to discuss the Army's outlook and perspective on weapon systems and equipment as we embark upon a very important chapter in the Army's history. Okay. I'm joined today by Lieutenant General Jim Barkley, Deputy Chief of Staff G8, Lieutenant General Keith Walker, okay, Deputy Commanding General of TRADOC, and Director of the Army Capabilities Integration Center, Lieutenant General Pat McQuiston, Deputy Commanding General and AMC, Lieutenant General Bill Phillips, my fabulous military deputy, <laughs> Basal, okay, and Ms. Mary Miller, the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Research and Technology. Thank you all for being here today with us. I'd like to start by uh, <laughs> talking a little bit and paint a big picture, and then uh, I will uh, introduce each of the panel speakers, and they will talk a little bit about their section and their perspective, follow on with, I'm going to ask them a number of questions, have them to articulate their answer perspective to you. Then I would like to open it up to the open forum for folks to uh, ask questions. And uh, the other thing, is there will be a press conference tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for the press who have uh, questions. There's an hour set aside for that as well. Okay. So thank you, all the panelists, for joining me, and thank you all for attending. The department as a whole is in the midst of a transition, as you well know, in terms of meeting challenging conditions. These conditions include the drawdown from two theaters of war, where we focus and continue to focus, in this case, Afghanistan, on the vital needs of our forces against asymmetric and adaptive threats. This transition will also include recognition of our expansive strategic interest, which calls for rebalanced emphasis on the peace and security of the Asia-Pacific region. Our change conditions also reflect that security threats, the technology that they may employ, and the scenarios we must be prepared to face. That's evolving. Okay. As we look ahead, any potential adversaries will have greater access to sophisticated and disruptive technologies that could greatly complicate our operations. We cannot afford to let technological change <coughs> level our advantage in any potential future conflict. 
this overall strategic context has given rise to what the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Ash Carter, has labeled a historic inflection point in national defense. So how are we preparing to meet the challenges in the coming years? And that's what we want to address today. Okay. Adding to yet another challenge is the reality that fiscal pressures will limit the resources we have in terms of conducting this transition. To address the priorities of our soldiers in combat over the past decade, the Army has developed and fielded an impressive range of cutting edge capabilities with resources targeted for that particular effort. The Army's modernization efforts have benefited greatly from this investment. Our command posts and systems transition from analog to a digital backbone. Our tactical mission command capabilities have been revolutionized to include enhanced situation awareness through force battle command brigade and below, those of you guys know FBCB2, okay, and blue force tracking as well as improved satellite communications. We feel the cutting edge individual soldier equipment like enhanced night vision goggles, which improves situation awareness. And we have developed and fielded pelvic pr protection gear, which has saved the lives of our soldiers. We have fielded M855A1, which is also known as enhanced performance rounds. It's a new 5.56 millimeter cartridge, which greatly increased consistency and accuracy and greater penetration. Okay. Also, we have successfully fielded platforms like AMRAPs, striker double V hulls, as well as precision artillery and mortar capabilities that added significantly to the capabilities of the Army. However, a broader set of equipment modernization needs now demands our attention following a decade of the focus on Afghanistan. We are facing physically constrained budgets as we undertake this transition. However, there can be no procurement holiday because unlike the 1990s, the threats we have faced have not receded. Matter of fact, they have grown more sophisticated. Added this to our reliance on healthy industrial base for critical scientific engineering and manufacturing skills that's essential to our modernization efforts. We recognize that maintaining the Army's leading edge in the futures depends upon this healthy industrial base. We have to make sound, prudent, and well-informed strategic investments in modernizing Army's capabilities. This is the part of our transition within the new strategic context. The Army is an institution that thrives on adaptation and change. Look at our long history. Just as we adapt to meet the needs of the past decades, we are actively preparing to meet new challenges over this horizon. So how do we get there? To equip the Army of the future, it is the right time to undertake a comprehensive and strategic approach to Army equipment modernization in which we adapt a systemic approach for planning and setting long-term equipping priorities. The Army has started a new process that's called a strategic modernization planning, which combines the detailed analysis of our current and planned investments in S&T and material development linked to our emerging threats and capability gaps across a long-term 30-year time frame. The output of this process will be a detailed roadmap for our future capabilities across the acquisition life cycle linking our S&T investments with our programs of record, which in turn are mapped to our long-term sustainment strategy. Our analysis is driven by strategic guidances developed through the National Military Strategy 
and joint warfighting concepts. Using this guidance, the Army requirements community is assessing present and emerging threats. To identify the capability gaps and equipping priorities across near, mid, and far term. Our PEOs are working to lay out our current and planned capabilities across a 30-year horizon, spanning from concept development to technology development to EMD to production to sustainment. In parallel, the Army is reassessing the investment in S&T across all of our portfolios to ensure that our S&T is appropriately linked to our acquisition roadmaps and facilitates insertion opportunities of the enabling technologies over time. Our strategic modernization planning will also integrate our long-term sustainment needs and priorities. So finally, we are linking, if you think about it, our S&T priorities that's linked to our programs of record to show insertion opportunities as function of time, okay? And linking our sustainment strategies into our programs of record. So we're, we don't want to push 100 programs into sustainment without a sustainment strategy well-defined. And all of them needs to be linked to where the threat is evolving to. We're developing and fielding capabilities address a broad spectrum of challenges. I'm going to give you a few examples of what we're doing. If you think about greater force protection for soldiers, that will remain a paramount consideration regardless of the region that we're fighting in. The Army will continue to develop systems to enhance and improve protection, whether it's soldier protection, whether it is vehicle protection, either ground vehicle or airborne platforms or post base protection. Okay. We will assess the critical technologies that will be required to improve our protection across the entire spectrum of different environments that we will face. Okay. Our development of platforms, for example, just one example like GCV, gives us the capability on the vehicle side, improves our survivability, our mobility, and carries the entire squad. It's also evident in our continuing pursuit of the very best soldier equipment that's available in this world, which includes uniform camouflage pattern, the continual investment in armor protection, easing the overburden of soldiers and small units is another key area of focus. As you well know, you guys have seen many photos of our soldiers in theater carrying incredible burden on their backs. Right? So we will continue to pursue technologies to drive down the weight. Some of the things we're doing there are like gen a soldier power generation system, an integrated power generation system you guys have seen our rucksacks with solar cell in the back of it to reduce our power need. Harnessing the renewable energy in austere environments. We're also looking at improved battery technology in smart textiles as potential solutions. Timely mission command tactical intelligence to provide enhanced situation awareness is a critical area that we will continue to focus on because you have already heard from the chief, we're networking our force down to the individual soldier. Critical technologies that's already in production are Win-T Increment 2, Jitters Rifleman Radio and Man Pack, and Continuing Development Joint Battle Command Platforms. It's the next generation of system to achieve command control and situation awareness on the battlefield. Four, reducing the logistic burden of storing, transporting, distri distributing, and retrograde of materials is clearly an area 
of focus for us. Some examples of how we've reduced weight, even down to uh, the stainless steel cartridge cage. An example is 7.62 millimeter family ammunition that reduces weight by 20%. We're looking at weight reduction across the spectrum. Okay. Establishing and maintaining operational overmatch through increased lethality and accuracy give our soldiers the best arms possible. XM25 is another system that successfully completed four operational assessment in Afghanistan. The soldiers love it, can't get enough of it. Okay. Joint effects targeting system, JETS. It's under development to provide dismount soldiers with a lightweight handheld capability to rapidly acquire, locate, and identify targets for engagement with precision munitions. <coughs> In terms of full spectrum maneuverability, high op tempo remains a key area of focus for the Army. Our commitment to development of GCV, Joint Light Tactical Vehicles, Paladin Integrated Management, or PIM, the Army's next generation self propelled uh, howitzer reflects this Army's commitment. We're also exploring modernized capabilities in the aviation portfolio for a possible new armed aerial scout and pursuit of a future vertical lift aircraft. The Army must also prioritize operational ca capabilities in a chemical, biological, nuclear, radiological environment. Okay. We will continue to develop critical capabilities and technologies sensors, protective equipment, and vaccines to defend against agents that's encountered on the battlefield. Okay. One example is the Medical Countermeasures Advanced Development and Manufacturing Program. This joint program was established to develop agile and flexible capability for medical and pharmaceutical countermeasure that will ensure rapid development, FDA license, and cost-effective production of medical and pharmaceutical countermeasure vaccines and therapeutics. Okay. Early detection of traumatic brain injury is a major area of focus for our Army. RPO soldiers working with NFL and academic partners on research regarding head injury pre prevention, mitigation, and protection that's associated with TBI. We we'll continue to invest in key areas such as biomarker detection of TBI. Successful developments of new technology to address operational allergy needs will be significant in the future. Examples include Army's investment in improved turbine engine or ITEP program with a goal of 25% reduction in fuel consumption in our aviation platforms. The mobile electric power program that's designed to achieve fuel efficiency and greater systems reliability through the next generation power sources while addressing tactical needs is another example. Individual and team training is a priority for our S&T research, focusing on the cognitive and behavioral sciences to understand how to develop training systems that enhance our soldiers' capabilities. Reducing life cycle cost across all of our platforms and systems remains an overriding focus. Joint light -like tactical vehicle, for example, includes planned fuel efficiencies on reduced static fuel consumption and achieve higher thermal efficiency in engines. What we, what we did over a period of one year on the joint light -like tactical vehicle program is also focus on developing a cost-informed requirement. This way we're able to trade off the requirements as function of cost to achieve our affordability target. So in summary, the Army equipment modernization is preparing our soldiers for the future. What I would like to do is introduce General Bartley Thank you, ma'am. I've just got a few uh, comments, and, and then I'll hand it off to the guy beside me. But as Madam Secretary said, uh, 
You heard if you went to the lunch day and heard the the chief. I mean, this is pulling out of his charts, and you talk about, and uh, Miss you also talked about it. But the, in the center, he says empowered soldiers and squads connected to a network and vehicles that increase mobility and lethality while retaining survivability. I mean, that's the centerpiece of where he's trying to take us as we look to the future. Now, part of the challenge of that is trying to modernize and equip our force, both for today and tomorrow, and doing it in, as some would might define, a constrained fiscal environment. So those are some of the, 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 the nuances of what we're trying to do as we move forward. First of all, in, in current today, uh, we've got to continue to provide those soldiers that we have. As the Chief said, we've got 80,000 deployed, about 60,000 still in Afghanistan, 20,000 Sinai, MFO, uh, Kosovo that are in harm's way. I mean, so we're still fighting a war, and we cannot lose sight of that. So we've got to continue to provide those soldiers what they need, and we've got to ensure that they get the things in a timely manner and do not allow the, the environment that we're living here in D.C. or physically to get so we can get it to them when they need it, and that's important. Some of the things we've been able to do is uh, over the last couple of years is we've met some of these or the uh, threats. I mean, if you look at IEDs and what we've done and how we have progressed over the last 11 years and getting after those changes and doing it in a rapid manner, that's what we've <laughs> got to continue to do to face and fix those challenges of today. In the future, uh, as most of you know, you know, you can look back and if you look at uh, uh, do a little bit of revisionist or if you try to use history and, and predict on where we're going to be in the future or what threats we're going to face or where we're going to be or what uh, enemy we're going to fight, you know, we don't have a very good history of doing that. Uh, we've, uh, our batting, if you had to do a batting percentage on how well we call the future, we uh, t typically don't do too good. So uh, with that in mind, we've got to look at a robust modernization program. It's got to be a program that uh, can achieve flexible, full-spectrum capabilities, and it's across, as Ms. you said, it's across a broad range of those threats, and taking those threats and integrating them as we try to look at a modernization uh, program moving forward. And part of that, uh, of course, we all know we're going to have to make some choices, and again, we're going to make these choices in a constrained fiscal environment. Uh, and, and some of the ways that we're doing this is we continue to review all the requirements that we're building. We look at those costs. We're doing it in the ways we've done it in the past, but we're also looking at new ways, as she said, as we stretch out and look at how we integrate those capabilities. So more than just at the individual system level, we're also looking across the capability portfolios and then across the different portfolios to ensure that we can get at whatever the gap is that we've defined at the best cost with the maximum effect of it. So those are some of the things that we're doing now. We're also structuring programs to take care of Amer American technology, competition, and commercial options. And part of that is in incremental buys and uh, allowing us to buy those enhancements over time. These are just some of the things that we're looking at as we move forward to, to give us that capability. We're also looking for solutions that are scalable, both in production and capability and can fit across multiple platforms. So wherever we can find those solution sets that fit across multiple platforms and give us those advantages, that's where we want to go in the future. And at the same time, as we move forward, we've got to be able to have a fork in the road because, as I said, we're not very good at calling the future. We've got to make changes at times. So we've got to be able to have that flexibility to make those changes. As the Chief said at lunch today, the conflicts are won and are avoided by having presence. Presence is having soldiers on the ground. So in doing that, we're looking for those, as I said, affordable, integrated capabilities that will empower and protect them and, and get us to where we need to be. Ms. Shue mentioned about the network and how we're linking all of our soldiers all the way down to the individual soldier, all the way back up to the top. And that's empowering those soldiers and squads because if you look at where we're going and what we do today and the fights we expect to be in, it's important that the soldier and the squad has that power and is linked in. We've also got to be able to protect them. That's part of our vehicle portfolios as we move forward. We've got the GCV, we've got the JLTV, and the AMPV programs coming up. And we always continue to look at body armor and those things that individually protect the soldiers as we move forward. We're also looking at providing offensive and defensive systems uh, that will help us deter and defeat the emerging threats. 
And that's uh, including giving our soldiers with some of the most effective weapon systems. And she mentioned the XM-25 is just a prime example of that. And then finally at the end, you know, our soldiers, you know, if you look back not only the last 10 years, but if for the last, for some of us who have been doing this for 34, 35 years, 36 years, I mean, our soldiers are very adaptable. They're very flexible. And a lot of times we don't give them the credit when it comes to giving them new pieces of, of kit or gear. They can handle it. They can do that. But what we've got to do is ensure when we do it that we do it in the right manner and it maximizes that flexibility and adaptability that they have. Thanks. Jim Walker. Thanks, ma'am. Thanks, Jim. You know, as I look out, I uh, see some familiar faces in the audience, not only just familiar in general, but also from yesterday. So <laughs> as I, I briefly give a few thoughts, I won't not repeat anything I talked about yesterday. But I, but I do want to make a few opening remarks in the context of, of what we're doing in the Army in the sense of tr transitioning from an Army of 580,000 soldiers at war in Iraq and Afghanistan to an Army of 490,000 in a completely different environment with completely different defense planning guidance and with lessons learned or baggage depending on how you look at it over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, it, it's that framework that sets up our own campaign of learning and as many of you know our campaign of learning is about developing our concepts and concepts are important because they determine what capabilities our soldiers and formations need in order to do what our nation asks of them. So I think it's interesting to have a, a, a little bit of historical perspective um, in the sense that change in the Army is, is often <coughs> the result of adaptation and innovation. And the availability of time and resources are, are the critical components there in terms of adaptation or innovation. Uh, General Marshall, to paraphrase him, and noted that in the Second World War he said, um, you know, before the war I had all the time in the world but no money. Now I have all the money in the world but no time. <laughs> but, or even a more favorite quote is uh, to do, well, paraphrase Winston Churchill who said, gentlemen, we are out of, out of money. It's time to think. <laughs> so adaptation then is usual a response to the exegesis of a particular situation that require immediate attention, crisis or conflict. And the outcomes of adaptation are often just-in-time solutions, um, things that are good enough, things that we can incrementally improve over time. And they're often transitory. And obviously what we've been doing over the last decade or so is adaptation and some very successful adaptation. Innovation, on the other hand, comes from a much more methodical development of possibilities um, to longer-term problems. And because it looks at the midterm and far term, it evolves over time and it's a lot more durable. So as we, as we conclude the war in Afghanistan and we look not only to the Army within this particular POM cycle, but at the Army beyond that, our challenge is how do we balance this whole adaptive, innovative aspect of our Army's modernization. So, you know, how might we do that? Uh, just talk about a few, give you all a few thoughts. Um, first is uh, I'd offer that modernization is more than just material development. We, you know, we have a construct, the dot mil PF construct, that's, that's it's useful. Um, we do have to modernize our doctrine. And, and in fact, we, we haven't been sitting still. Uh, this coming week we will publish a completely new set of doctrine in, in uh, Doctrine 2015 coming from the combined um, arm center. Organizational changes. We have worked very hard over this last year and will continue in this year's campaigning to look at our organizational structure from the squad all the way through Army Service Component Commands because yes, one of the things that the Army uniquely provides to the Joint Force is a campaign capability. Um, training. We, uh, we have worked very hard at the Army training strategy. We've developed the, the decisive action training environment which recognizes this complex environment that, that we anticipate should we employ our soldiers in the future, uh, that they'll be in an environment where they have to be able to do combined arms maneuver and the rather messy uh, situation of uh, ununiformed combatants mixed up with 
all kinds of other state and non-state actors. Um, in our home station training, we used to be very good at home station training, but, but for the past decade, our training really has come up to, you knew you were going to Iraq or Afghanistan, you went to a combat training center, you did a mission rehearsal, and off you went. We are returning back where we have to, to, to rethink our Army training strategy. Uh, on the material side, we've, had, we've, we've benefited uh, with the, the generosity of folks who provide us resources and have been able to get our soldiers material solutions that they needed to, to fight the war. And indeed, it has saved lots of lives and has helped us with the mission. Uh, but in doing so, I would offer that we have maybe not looked at the training as well as we should have not looked at the leader development aspects as much as we should. So again, modernization is broader. Um, and we recognize that there are resource constraints as we work the material solutions with my teammates uh, here on the panel. Uh, leader development, another aspect, you know, we have a, a um, basically we talk about leader development in terms of a triad, education, training, and experience. Our Army right now is long on experience. We're short relatively speaking on education and training, we have to get back into balance as part of our transition and Army modernization. Uh, personnel, there'll be personnel policies that we need to look at, facilities, there'll be facilities that we need to look at as we transition the Army. But just a few thoughts on modernization is more than just material. Um, a, a couple other thoughts. Uh, in. Um, Analysis and evidence is, uh, if it's, it's always been important, but I'll tell you it's a lot more important now than it's ever been from my perspective. So we're working very hard on the analysis that we do with the TRADOC Analysis Center and everyone else in the Army that's in that business. For example, when we do our capabilities analysis, we have always done that functionally. Um, but we don't fight as war fighting functions. We don't fight as intelligence or movement and maneuver or fires and sustainment. We fight as formations. So one of, the, uh, one of the things that we're doing in terms of having a more comprehensive look at, um, at capabilities and requirements is to take a functional look too, to get a cross-cutting approach at what otherwise would be a stovepipe <coughs> functional look. Um, the complex environment that we've talked about um, is dominated in the future by human factors. And those human factors, I mean, what armies do on land Yes, the threat is extremely important, but we've got to make sure we look beyond the threat. We have to recognize strengths, we have to look for weaknesses, we have to look for opportunities, and yes, we have to look for threat. For example, because of threats, we came up with some tremendous adaptive counter IED solutions, unmanned air systems, the XM25, for a specific threat. But you know, we also developed a network because we had opportunity. Um, we we started working at operational energy because that's a weakness we have and accounts for a huge logistics tail. And, um, and in terms of opportunities, the entire night vision capability we have is because an opportunity presented themselves and some really bright folks, uh, operators and acquisition folks, took advantage of those opportunities. So we may have to make sure we, we do that. We have to look at rapid acquisition, the best of rapid acquisition. A rapid acquisition has been great. But it's had a couple in, in that, yes, for mission, yes, for saving lives, but it's had some shortcomings in the sense of we haven't necessarily had our soldiers in formations as well trained as we'd like to with a standard program of record. The other thing about our rapid acquisition is we have not accounted for uh, life cycle sustainment cost. So somehow, as we do our transition, we, we need that capability to maintain the best of rapid acquisition, but accounting for that shortfalls in training and uh, life cycle sustainment. And I think we can do that. And then the last point um, I'll make, and then, and then I'll close, because we'll get a chance for questions, is we as an Army, and this is, this is something TRADOC uh, has to do for the Army and will do for the Army in this year's fiscal year 13's campaign of learning, we have to develop a deep concept. And by deep, I mean out to 2030. The Army has not had a deep concept in quite a while. And, and, and honestly, with good reason, our war fight and our focus has been very short in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan. But some of the consequences of that, when you look at capabilities required to prosecute that concept, it's a pretty short-term time horizon. So when the, when the department has to plan and prepare a science and technology program 
we're not properly informing that effort because we're so short. So we will step back and make a very deliberate effort uh, to gather some very bright people from industry, academia, and with our own, within our own research and development communities along with operators to get an understanding of what's what may physically be possible in the year 2030 or so, because honestly, I don't know. But once I understand what's physically possible from the threat and from uh, and what our country can do, uh, then we can talk about some concepts that are out there, and then we can better inform um, our science and technology effort. So those are a few things that, um, that we're thinking about as we go through in terms of uh, modernizing the Army, and I'll pass to my partner on the left. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ms. Shu, on behalf of General Bai, thank you for including Army Material Command in this critical panel. You know, I was thinking about this topic as I was uh, preparing, and I thought back to a presentation that happened at the AUSA annual meeting that AMC delivered back in 1998. Back then, they called it the big show, and it was a multimedia presentation that was led by General Johnny Wilson, who was the AMC commander at the time. There was no PowerPoint, but there was singing and there was dancing, and there was a lot of demonstration of capability and technology that the Army was thinking about at that point in time. It was entitled, What We Are Doing for the Soldier of 2020, and it had a subtitle called Critters, Spikers, and Tortellini. And it uh, started with a, uh, a scene at a playground with six- and seven-year-old boys and girls pr making predictions about the future. Well, I'm sure that some of those six and seven year olds then are wearing sergeant stripes and lieutenant bars now. I was so impressed watching that video, and I'll point out that we had to transfer it from VHS to DVD so that I could watch it. <laughs> uh, but it just reminded me again of the power of vision coupled with focused resources to prepare our forces for future requirements. This was pre-2001, but we knew that the future was volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Remember, we all said VUCA. It was clear as I watched how much they had it about right. Now, not everything was right, but what it allowed us to do was to innovate and adapt when we needed to do it. And I was able to take all of the concepts and the things that they were demonstrating from food operational rations to some of the robotics and the equipment and the night vision and the soldier protection and how we were able to, with our industry partners to adapt it very quickly as we needed to do it. But it was more than just about the material. It was adapting ideas and technologies as well as products and processes. And I guess what I would say to my panel mates and the, the folks in the audience that are our teammates as well in this is that I would hope that we would be more accurate in our visions for the future even than they were in 1998. AMC provides material availability for our Army and we support our sister services and our allies around the world. We have physical presence or economic impact in all of the 50 states and 144 countries around the world. We touch every phase of the material life cycle, although we are not the only players, and we understand that very well. But we're key players with our strategic partners like ASALT and Transcom and the Defense Logistics Agency and most of all private industry. And we provide integrated end-to-end -end life cycle management and sustainment of systems and equipment. And we provide transportation and distribution <laughs> services to warfighters around the world. And we do it every day, 24-7, um, and anywhere that soldiers are stationed. From research and development to contracting, manufacturing and remanufacturing in our depots, arsenals, and our ammu ammunition plants, we reset, we do modernize, we overhaul. We have foreign military sales, we do global distribution and material management of supplies and equipment, and our top priority will always be getting the right equipment to our soldiers, what they require to accomplish their missions any time and any place in the world. You know, through all of our collective efforts, we've achieved readiness rates of over 92% over the last 10 years in the operation. I mean, that is just phenomenal when you think about the op tempo. That's in our ground systems and our aviation systems have done marvelously well too, given, again, the operational environment and the tempo that we're using those assets at. 
To support Ms. Hsu's 30-year strategy, the strategic modernization planning, we've organized and aligned resources within AMC for new approaches and responses. We've established a command technology office under the direction of Dr. Grace Bahanek. Grace, please stand up because I want everybody to know who to address the questions to. <laughs> <laughs> and we've aligned tremendous capabilities within our research, development, and engineering command under Mr. Dale Ormond. We're focused on efforts deemed most important, as the other panel members have talked about it or will talk about, such as soldier omniscience, force protection, mission command, lightening the load, and rapid prototyping. We understand that it's crucial to leverage academia, industry, and our services, labs, and research facilities to invest where we must and to leverage the efforts of others where we can. For those Army requirements that we must invest in, RDECOM defines the space between the state of the art and the art of the possible. It executes an S&T portfolio of $1.5 billion last year, 72% of the Army's investment in S&T. It employs more than 16,000 people, 10,000 of those are scientists and engineers. We execute uh, or the proponent for 214 out of the Army's 281 international agreements with our allies and execute over 70 grants with foreign researchers and 60 multidisciplinary university research initiatives. We work with over 1,200 single investigator research projects and synchronize activities of seven major laboratories. We develop AMC's programs based on the guidance from the Department of the Army staff and particularly the Ms. Shoes ASALT Department. And in partnership with TRADOC and FORCECOM, universities, other national labs, and our allies. We are tightly tied in with program and executive offices and other commands who execute sustainment through equipment life cycles and our partners like the Defense Logistics Agency who are critical supply chain providers. And as Keith said, the Army's modernization efforts don't stop with S&T and material development. It encompasses for us people, processes, equipment, and facilities. So we look for modernization throughout all our lines of effort in ensuring Army readiness, supporting current operations, managing <coughs> material life cycles, supply chain management, and workforce development. We know that 65 to 70 percent of life cycle costs are in the sustainment arena. And we have an opportunity now with this 30-year plan and the modernization planning effort to focus some of those S&T investments on reducing sustainment costs to lower absolute life cycle costs. And some ways have already been discussed, but I'll, I'll say them as well. Developing common platforms and parts used across multiple platforms, not just for our Army and our allies, but our other services. Enhancing fuel efficiency and improving operational energy to reduce power consumption. And reducing maintenance costs through efforts like condition-based maintenance, prognostics, diagnostics, onboard maintenance. Increasing reliability and increasing the use of recyclable materials. We must also continue to modernize our industrial base, organic and commercial aspects, and it will be best of all if we do it in partnership. The Army Organic Industrial Base is not just for Army equipment, but it provides for joint warfighters and our allies as well. We can also point out modernization efforts of our Enterprise Resource Planning System, our LMP Logistics Modernization Program. We started that uh, deployment of that in 2003, and in 2011 it became the first Army ERP system to reach full deployment. It supports over 21,000 users and it integrates more than 70 Department of Defense systems to feed life cycle information. Talked a little bit about supply chain modernization and supply chain management, and we have to also take looks at how we can focus on those efforts and get the best value from our suppliers and distributors. Our Joint Munitions Command provides conventional ammunition for all the services, and they've developed a supply chain strategy that gives them close to omniscience about their suppliers down to the individual chemical or mineral compound that they need to produce their portfolio of munitions. It's a really powerful tool that enables better decision making and visibility of potential impacts on production and ways to optimize planning for future requirements. They call it IBATS, the Industrial Base Assessment Tool. And I think that we need to extend those kind of decision support tools and visibility tools throughout our other weapon systems and our other equipment lines. 
And last, I'll talk about workforce development, because doing all of this requires a trained, skilled, and committed workforce, and we have been very blessed to have that. Just in AMC alone, we have 69,000 folks working around the world on all of these different endeavors. 24% of them are wage-grade civilians. Those are the skilled artisans in our depots, plants, and ammo facilities who produce material to keep our soldiers ready. And some of them are one-of-a-kind skill sets, second and third generation artisans that work in our depots and arsenals. 59% of our personnel hold a bachelor's degree, master's degree, or a PhD. And 67% of our civilians are professional, technical, or administrative. We are committed to developmental programs that sustain their current skills and provide for future skills. You know what separates the United States military from others in the world is not just that we are the best trained, best equipped, and best led force. It's that we provide the best logistics in the world and the ability to project power where others cannot. AMC helps enable our Expeditionary Army for prompt support and sustains our Army through extended campaigns and wars. No one can match those capabilities. Those who we support trust us. We've earned that trust by hard work, visionary leadership, proving our relevance every day, and by not only sharing the burdens of combat, but by relieving many of those burdens by rapidly identifying problems and providing solutions on site. We'll build on that trust as we shape and set conditions for the future to respond to whatever our nation asks us to do. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, Ms. Shu. And as other panel members have stated and will state, we cannot be satisfied with the great accomplishments we've learned about today, but we must become more efficient in everything we do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, what a great honor it is to be here to, uh, once again at AUSA and, and have an opportunity to talk about something that's, uh, that's very important. I'm honored to be a member of this distinguished panel and my terrific boss, the Honorable Heidi Shu, And I did not coordinate my comments with Pat McQuistion, my battle buddy to my right, but the last subject that she spoke about is really what I want to want to uh, sh share with you about the acquisition workforce and some of the key things that we're doing to build a stronger, better acquisition workforce. And I know, General Wagner, you have great interest in this, and it's always great to see you here and sharing this forum. But we are, we are making greater strides in, in managing our acquisition workforce that is so critical to what our Army does today. Uh, the central mission of acquisition that you've heard from many that have already spoken is really to equip our soldiers with the best weapons and the best equipment available in order to give them the decisive edge. If we ever allow our soldiers to go into a battle and even fight, we have failed in the equipping business. And I would venture to say that our acquisition workforce and our acquisition team has failed. We cannot allow that to happen. We have to make sure that they're ready to go anytime, any mission, 24-7, to fight and win. And then one day come home safely to their families and their friends. That's essentially what I heard General Odierno say this morning at the congressional breakfast. And as, as I listened to him at lunch, he also shared some of those same words. We collectively, the members of this panel and others behind us, about 42,000 strong in the acquisition workforce, we design, develop, and deliver capability. And I'll borrow another word that General O said at, uh, at lunch today. He used dominance. We give them the equipment that allows them to dominate on the field of battle. And again, never go into a fair fight. We are the best equipped army in the world. That doesn't happen by chance. It happens because of the hard work and dedication of a lot of folks. Some of them wear uniforms, some are government civilians, some are contractors, some are our industry partners. Our industry partners are so critical to making sure that we deliver the right capability for our war fighters. We can never fail them. And I'll also paraphrase General Austin at a, at a uh, breakfast yesterday when I was listening to him. He, and General, o, General Odierno mentioned some of this as well during his luncheon speech, but the Army is about people soldiers. The Army is people and soldiers. They are most important. So I share with you also that the Acquisition Corps is about people. Our world-class acquisition workforce remains critical to our mission. They are a true national asset. And I think sometimes that they are the most underappreciated skill set within our Army. 
Our acquisition professionals will never let our soldiers down. They are committed to our soldiers' complete success, delivering equipment today, working on the next generation of equipment, whether it's S&T, research and development, so we can put that in their hands so they can be successful. You've heard from many of our panel members talking about the acquisition process as a whole. This doesn't get done without the members of our acquisition work workforce working on requirements generation, science and technology, sustainment strategies, acquisition strategies, resource strategies. It simply will not happen because every member of this panel has an acquisition workforce member inside their formation in some capacity. We won't execute contracts with industry if we don't have trained, ready, skilled contracting officers that know how to work with industry collectively to make sure that we get a fair and reasonable deal for industry and for the government and that we can get that product that you might be delivering as quickly as possible in the, hand, in the hands of our soldiers. So we are 42,000 strong. So some of the members of the panel, uh, I'm so glad that General McQuestion talked about workforce development. She has 27, over 27,000 acquisition workforce professionals. And as we have shared a number of phone calls, VTCs and others over the last uh, four or five months, I know that she has personally taken on working not just the, the AMC workforce as a whole, but she's helping us with our acquisition workforce as well. Ms. Hsu has about 5,100 acquisition professionals that work for her inside PEOs. Uh, General Bostic isn't here. I don't think he's in the audience, but he has over, uh, over 3,800 acquisition professionals that work for him. And Keith Walker, my battle buddy, uh, has about 1,400. Now, I don't know if this is true, but Al Resnick, Al Resnick is over there. I don't know if you're a member of the acquisition workforce. You might be. I'm not sure. <laughs> but if you're not, there's another 1,400 that are out there that are your battle buddies. And then Jim Barclay has a number of acquisition military folks that work on his staff as well. We are all touched in some kind of way. There's not a single command in the Army that doesn't have an acquisition workforce person working with them in some capacity to help deliver capability to soldiers. Most importantly, if you look at theater today, we've got about 7,500 folks that are downrange. Now, about 5,000 of those are industry partners. Now, I would define them as a point of the spear. They may be delivering equipment, but in most cases, they're probably delivering a service. They're at the end of the spear, delivering capability to soldiers